So, well, let's introduce. I'm Milena Santos Teixeira. I'm a PhD candidate in the University of Trento. I uh, should be actually be concluding my PhD in the next maybe two months or so. And today I'll be talking, I'll be discussing the research I conducted during my PhD. So in this presentation, oh, sorry, I think it's not working. Okay. In this presentation, uh, I'll start by introducing what are health dialogue systems. Then I discuss the goal of my research. Uh, next, I need to provide you some background on dialogue systems so you understand where my research is positioned. Uh, finally, I'll introduce the approach that we proposed that was uh, de developed during my PhD program, the evaluation that we conducted, and finally, we conclude this presentation. So health dialogue systems can benefit health uh, across, across different application domains. There are several systems for these domains. Uh, some examples are given here. We might have, for example, systems that support a physician on diagnosis. Uh, in these systems, a physician talk uh, to the system describing what are the symptoms that the patient has, and then this system will talk back, uh, supporting this decision. We can also have systems that provide health education where a patient or just a user person will ask the system about a given domain and then the system will provide some reliable knowledge on that domain. And several other examples like surge of recovery where the system reminds the patient on what to do, what are the, what are the actions that he must be taking and so on. But now let me show you which are the type of health dialogue systems that I am approaching my research. So let's start by taking a look at this action plan. So this is the action plan that was developed by physicians, by health experts for the asthma domain. So in this plan, uh, the physician described which are all the possible symptoms that an asthma patient might have during some asthma attack. They also identified which are the possible levels, which are the possible uh, levels of uh, asthma crisis that a patient may have. And then they provide like uh, the recommendations uh, indicating what should be done according to each situation. So here we can take a closer look at one of the zones just, to, just for you to have a better idea. So this is the yellow zone. You can see here that this zone might have four, four different symptoms, rinitz and cough, dry fecal cough. The patient might have some cough white when running. And according to the symptoms, uh, the recommendation given is the one in the middle column. So we want, what we want to do is to transform this knowledge into a chatbot, into a dialogue system that will provide the same information to the, to the patient as we see in this action plan. So here I have, uh, well, I don't see the full image here, I hope to do. So we have an example of the prototype that we developed during my research. Uh, this is a chatbot, it's called PoofBot. And this uh, agent is uh, basically asks the patient how the patient is feeling. In the second first response of the patient here, you can see that the patient says, I cough while running. As we see in the asthma example, the action plan, this was part of the yellow zone. And then our agent keeps asking more information, uh, trying to retrieve more symptoms, try to acquire my, more information to classify the, the situation of this patient and provide the according recommendation. And why we want this in the form of a dialogue system? Well, first of all, we always have our phones in your hands. So it's a very, useful way of providing this information. And also it can provide information in a more natural way. So this is just asthma. It's just one of the simple examples, but we can think of several other domains for which there might be way more information, way more knowledge, and having a natural conversation with a chatbot would be very beneficial to the patient. Also, it has been proven that in many research, that uh, this kind of systems, they can really improve the health condition of patients since they can, they, they can have reliable information that is providing knowledge based on a physician knowledge and not just on a Google search, for example. But despite the benefits of health dialogue systems, 
the systems are still very limited and they lag behind traditional conversational domains. And when I say traditional, I refer to the kind of systems that are most exploited, uh, usually in data-driven approach, which are usually dialogue systems for booking a trip, booking a restaurant, uh, or booking a hotel, and so on. So health dialogue systems present some additional challenge to these systems. Why? Because uh, health dialogue systems, they must be predictable. We must know in advance how the system will behave in each different situation. Uh, we cannot risk having a system that will provide some information that is not in accord to, doesn't agree with what a physician would say. We cannot uh, risk having a state in that dialogue for which we, the system doesn't really know how to act. So they must be predictable. They must be reliable. They must follow the same reason that an expert should, uh, should have for that situation. And we also cannot waste interactions. We can, the system should not be asking about information that, okay, might be useful, but maybe uh, will postpone the identification of emergencies. So these systems are more critical. More critical. And considering this challenge, several approaches for health dialogue systems, they, they usually rely on semantic aware strategies that implement ontologies to build this kind of uh, systems. But a challenge still in these systems is to automate the generation, uh, their generation, because most of, not most, but many of them, they, they rely on handcrafted policies. The dialogue tree and the di or the dialogue policy is either partially or fully handcrafted. So a question that is still open in the health, in health dialogue systems, how can we automate the generation of new reliable agents? So this brings us to the goal of my research, where my goal was to integrate information management and AI planning to automate and simplify the generation of goal-oriented dialogue managers, uh, always keeping the focus on the health domain. So we can go back to the asthma example I showed you before. Um, when I say goal-oriented here, I mean systems that uh, conduct the whole conversation, they conduct the whole interaction, trying to achieve a final goal. So if you go back to that example, you can see that the system, the agent was asking some questions, trying to reach a classification and then provide a recommendation to the patient. This is different of chatbots uh, that will just ask some random questions, uh, like have a chit chat or, uh, different kind of conversation. Uh, when I mentioned before, systems that, con uh, that provide information on health, health education, usually these systems are not goal oriented. They, the patient makes a question, they reply this question, but they don't have a whole conversation with terms that have a final goal. So our focus here is on systems that have a final goal. Uh, yeah, but before showing the approach that we proposed, uh, I need to provide you some fundamental background on dialogue systems. And starting by uh, task-oriented or goal-oriented is the same. These kind of systems, they usually, they rely on this traditional pipeline where we first, when we receive the user input, we have a natural language understanding layer. This layer is where we, is extract that user input and we here we identify which are the intents what is this uh, user trying to say trying to tell the bot next we have the dialogue manager component this component should identify which is the current state of the dialogue and then decide what to do next here is where we have the dialogue tree the state action pairs and only then we have the natural natural language generator component which is responsible for translating this decision of the system to something that is understandable by the final user. And all these layers, they have uh, the, the implements, uh, they, they have several complex, they can be very complex, especially when addressing health dialogues. So to be suitable for the three year three years PhD program, in my research, we're focusing on the dialogue manager component only. So reminded, this component is the one responsible for identifying the current state of the dialogue and then take the decision on what to do next. Here is where we have the dialogue policy, the dialogue tree that uh, keeps the whole workflow, the whole, the whole sequence of actions that should be conducted in the dialogue. 
And a very good candidate to automate the generation of this dialog tree is automated planning. So what is planning? Planning is a subfield of artificial intelligence uh, that consists on the automated search. From, uh, so it has an initial state and planning generates the whole path that will lead you to a goal state. In this example here, I have a graph uh, that corresponds in a dialog. It corresponds to the dialog policy, to the dialog tree. And where all the nodes here represent a possible state of the dialog, Meanwhile, the, the arrows, the edges, represent the actions that are applied for in each of that, the states. So whenever we apply an action, we'll be, we'll be an, in a new state of the dialog. And if you see, all the possible paths here lead to the final state, which is the goal of the dialog. So to use automated planning, which is a knowledge-based part of artificial intelligence, we need to specify all the possible, uh, all the available actions in that environment. So we need to specify uh, which are the preconditions for each of these actions. We need to specify which are the effects, what, what each action will cause in, in the environment, in the real world when it's applied, and a set of other, uh, other things also must be specified in the planning domain. So planning is used mainly in robotics, is used in automated driving and several other fields. And uh, recently, it's a little less exploited, but uh, planning has been also seen as a great candidate for dialogue management. In our case, planning is, uh, can automate the generation of the dialogue policy. And planning has several benefits for dialogue. Uh, planning can be, planning is predictable if you, if you we take a look at the dialogue, uh, the graph generated, we know in advance how planning will behave, how the dialogue will behave in each situation, in each given state. Planning, and uh, one of the greatest benefits of planning is to automate the generation of huge dialogue trees. Uh, here is just a very simple example, uh, but uh, an actual dialogue system will result in huge graphs that we cannot even draw here and which could not be easily designed by hand. So one of the greatest benefits of planning is automating the generation of these graphs. But planning is also not perfect. Planning also has some challenges, especially when addressing health dialogues. For example, how can the planner reason on the most useful action in a given state, especially if you take into account the health requirements? Let's suppose that we are in a state of the dialogue where we have two possible, where the agent can ask about two different symptoms that the patients have in that moment. One of the symptoms will lead the, the bot to identify that this is an emergency. The other symptom is also useful information, but maybe we will not identify this emergency. So how can the planning know according to the health requirements, which is, uh, which is the most useful action? Also, Modeling the behavior of the dialogue as a planning problem is seen as a very complex task. Why? Because the dialogue author, the person that's modeling the dialogue, they are already required to have some knowledge in, on the domain for which they are modeling the dialogue. In our example here, a dialogue author would, have, would need to have knowledge on asthma, the asthma domain. And also, of course, they must have knowledge on dialogue modeling, a dialogue author must know what is a slot. A dialogue author must, must know what is an intent and many other um, concepts and uh, yeah, concepts related to dialogue systems. And we cannot expect that this dialogue author will also have knowledge on automated planning. This is not realistic and not many dialogue authors have this knowledge. So planning could really benefit from the integration of some other mechanism that formalize the concepts of a dialogue and of the domain specific, uh, yeah, the domain, the specific knowledge for the domain for which the dialogue is being deployed. And ontologies meet this definition. So for this reason, in this work, we are integrating planning and ontologies. And to answer the previous question, how can we identify the useful information uh, according to the health requirements? We provided a usefulness framework to support uh, planning on this decision. So now I can finally introduce the approach we're proposing. So this is an overview. This is the architecture of the approach proposed during my research. 
As you can see, this uh, architecture is composed mainly of three units, three main units, where we have model acquisition, we have a planning unit, and we have the dialogue execution unit. And this approach is supported by two external resources. One is an ontology, and the other one is a usefulness framework. The plan here is not seen as an external resource because it's generated in the planning layer. So it's a consequence of the this unit here in the middle. So it's not like a resource. So now I'll give you more details about each of these units and this and also a resource by starting from the ontology we develop. So in my work uh, together with my research group in Trento, we developed this ontology, uh, which is it's called Convology, the conversational ontology. And there we formalized the whole, uh, the whole idea, the whole, uh, yeah, the whole, yeah, the whole idea for a goal-oriented conversational domain. So in the A box of the ontology, in the assertional box, we provided all the knowledge that is common, the domain-dependent knowledge that is common to any dialogue system. So here we are not limited to health dialogue systems, but any oriented dialogue. For example, we have the definition of the actors that can participate in a dialogue, usually the agent and the user. We have the definition of what are conversation items. Uh, for example, what is a slot in a dialogue? What is an intent, which is a dialogue action and so on. We also have the definition of dialogue states, uh, events that can happen to dialogue. So this part is completely independent for, of any domain, and this ontology can be reapplied into a new domains. And anytime we want to deploy this ontology into a new domain, we need to provide the term, no, sorry, the assertion box of the ontology. So in the A box of the ontology is where we provide all domain-specific knowledge. If you go back to our asthma example, all these symptoms that we that were described in the action plan. In this ontology, they should correspond to instance of a slot. So here, the yellow part is the domain dependent part of the ontology. Meanwhile, the, the right side of the image corresponds, corresponds to all those instances, to the, all those symptoms that we saw before. So this knowledge must be provided by a dialogue author during the implementation, during the deployment of a new domain. And it, it's part of the domain specific uh, knowledge uh, in your case, in the asthma example from, for, the, uh, for, for the asthma, we should implement all, the, all that action plan here. And this step should be conducted during the model acquisition unit, it's part of the model acquisition unit. So in this unit, our dialogue author should uh, specify in the ontology all those components, uh, but one thing here is that we don't require the dialogue author to specify all the elements of the dialogue. Given that knowledge, for example, these symptoms correspond to slots, as I previously said. So if you have some symptoms, if you have slots in a dialogue, we know that at some point in the dialogue, uh, uh, probably the user will try to provide that symptom, will try to provide that information. If the user, so it corresponds to an intent in the dialogue, the user has the intent of inform, informing that uh, symptom. Uh, if the user doesn't provide that information, then the agent should ask about that information. So this corresponds to a request action in your dialogue system. So there are some parts of the dialogue that can be automatically inferred from that initial knowledge. And for this, we have a populator that will be executed after the dialogue auto provides the, the main, some, main, some domain specific knowledge, we run this populator that derives further information in the ontology. After having all the knowledge instantiated in our ontology, we can go to the planning layer. So the planning layer is in charge of exploiting all that knowledge in convology and translating it into a specification that is understandable by a state-of-the-art planner. So uh, in summary, we map the knowledge in convology, the knowledge from convology into, into a language that is understandable by the, plan, uh, the automated planner, which is uh, in our case here, we are using the PDDL language. So let's take a look at some more details in the kind of planning that we're using. So as I previously mentioned, the plan that we generate in this dialogue corresponds to our dialogue policy or the di or dialogue tree. 
Uh, in this kind of dialogues, we are relying on non-deterministic planning because when you execute an action in a dialogue, we have a set of possibilities that we know that can happen after that uh, action, but we are not really sure which one of them will happen. If you make a question, you know the possible answers, but it's only like execution time that we can know which is the actual answer, which is the actual outcome of that action. So for this reason, we are using phone planning, which is the fully observable non-deterministic planning, uh, which uh, if you see here in the graph, when executing an action, let's take a look at the first one, A0, I hope you can see it. We have a set of possible states, but only during execution we identify which one of them was the actual one. So the state of the art planners for now, the best planner for this kind of planning is the PRP planner. So we built this kind of planner for generating the plans. We also rely on strong cyclic planning. As you can see in this graph, it doesn't matter the path you take in the dialogue, we always achieve the goal. So this kind of planning guarantee that the dialogue will not die. There will, there will always be an option to continue the dialogue, maybe repeat a question, maybe go back a state, but we can always go there. And we also rely on replanning. Uh, although we have this kind of planning, some errors still can happen during the dialogue. Something no expected might come up because it's not possible to anticipate all possibilities in each state of the dialogue. This would result in a huge and not realistic dialogue tree. So we make some assumptions here where uh, if something unexpected happens, if you have some error during the dialogue, we can always uh, set the initial state, reset the initial state of the of our planning problem, and replan, rebuild a new dialogue tree, and always continue our dialogue interaction. So uh, the translation from convolved to PDDL in this translation, we generate a few different kind of actions in our planning problem. Here uh, I'm not show all of them because it can be quite extensive. But here I'll show you two of the main actions that we have. So this action, this is specified in PDDL, the planning language. This action corresponds to a translation from an instance of Convolage that makes a request for a slot. In this case, this slot is called S1. So the thing is that when are we requesting this slot? Well, as a precondition to ask about a slot, a symptom, is that we still don't have this information. So if this slot, if this simple is empty, we need to ask for this. And also we need to know that this is the most useful slot to ask at that moment. We can only ask this slot if this is the most useful. As a consequence of executing the action, either we'll have a value for, for that information, either the patient answered the information and then we have a value. And then if you have this information, maybe we'll have a classification, maybe we'll achieve the goal of the dialogue. Or maybe we did understand what the patient say, and then we have a fallback intent. So this is a non-deterministic action, and it's only during execution time that we'll know which of these effects have happened. And the other action that I want to show you is the search most useful slot. So how did you define this predicate from the previous action, the request action? So the, is, this is most useful predicate is defined in this action which is also a non-determinist action that will take all the missing slots, all the information that is still missing in that dialogue, and it will identify which one of them is the most useful action. And OK, then I'm aware that this part here might be a little confusing, especially for who is not much into planning. Uh, how can you define which is the most useful one? So it's important to say that planning is just an abstraction of the available actions. Planning doesn't really implement the actions. So it abstracts their whole idea and creates the sequence of actions. It's actually only during execution time that we can, uh, that you have this implementation, that you have all the code specifying how each action is implemented. So in this example here, the definition of who is the most useful slot is also can be only made during execution time and based on the previous information, the information that you already acquired for that dialogue. So going back to our architecture, our useless framework is part of the execution model. Although the, action, the actions are defined, are abstracting the planning problem, it's only during execution time that we identify the most useful slot. So uh, yeah, I want to show you 
uh, summarize you the what is inside this usage framework. So what is that? So this framework is based on an agent-based framework, which was developed for goal-driven problems, focusing, focusing on the needs of the health domain. So this framework was an extension of a, of a co-author previous work, where they defined uh, the information usage, how to identify the most useful piece of information for cognitive systems. So we extended this framework, focusing more on addressing how can we address health dialogues. So this framework provides two main actions, two main contributions. One, it identifies which is the most useful action to perform. So given all the information that we already acquired in that dialogue, uh, this framework allows us to identify which is the next most useful piece of information, which should be the next action to be taken by our agent. And the framework also supports the classification. It's through this framework that we can identify when the goal is achieved, when you have enough information to say, yeah, this patient is having a light crisis. This patient is an emergency. So it's always with support of this framework. And I will not give you many details on the framework to not extend too much this presentation, but I will summarize this idea, uh, what it relies on. So our framework uh, relies on ACLOS priority. If you remember the asthma action plan that I showed before, it had different colors. And for the asthma domain, we can have some emergencies, we can have some lighter crises, but also more risky ones. So some domains, they can have this priority. Uh, the framework also analyzes how much information is filled by a slot, because we can, let's think of a diagnosis example, we can have some symptoms that are present in several diseases. So if I ask this piece of information, maybe I'll be reaching, I'll be closer to several goals to identify many diseases. Or maybe if I ask on this other slot, it's presenting only one disease, maybe to lead me only to that disease. So how important is to ask on a, a piece of information that is present in several, several classes. Also, we take into account slots weight. Uh, this is part of the main specific knowledge. Uh, the, the expert actually can define weights for the different slots for the different symptoms that we have. One symptom might be more relevant for classifying a uh, disease than the other. So this is also possible. And also we need to take into account the overall importance of requesting a slot. So this means uh, what will happen if I ask this information and the patient says, no, I don't have the symptom. And also what will happen if I ask the information and the patient say, yes, I have the symptom. So how close do you get to a classification on both of these situations? And this is actually a peculiarity of the healthcare domain, because in this domain, we, it's important for us both to classify, to identify that the patient has, is in a given class, for example, the patient has a disease, but it's also important to understand when the patient does not have this disease. So based on all the information that I already acquired, I know that for sure this patient doesn't have this disease. We cannot discard this information. This is also important for our decision. So here is just as uh, not just as but this is the final function that we have, it, which uh, represents all the these concepts I described before. And for the classification, uh, our framework, our approach selects the option always that gets most close to a classification. So here we have a threshold, which is also part of the main specific knowledge, which will depend on each application or how certain you want to be about the classification. And we, and we developed two strategies for identifying the goal. One is a coverage strategy. In this strategy, we try to ask as much information as possible to reduce as much as possible the uncertainty of the agent in the domain. And our other approach, the fast, fast solving approach, where the agent will try to reach the goal as quick as possible, trying to identify some emergency, and then it will stop as soon as it classifies the, the first goal. So the decision on which one to use is also part of the main specific knowledge and it will depend on your application. So as I previously said, the usefulness framework is part of the dialogue execution unit. So this is the unit that will actually interact with the final user. 
Here is where we connect the natural language layers, which are external to our approach. Here we integrate in natural language understanding. We also need the natural language generator that will generate the final sentence to the users. And during execution, our executor will consult the, the policy that was generated in the previous step to understand how it should conduct, how it should proceed with, with our dialogue. Uh, an important thing, uh, this, as you can see, this dialogue executor is part of online reasoning. So it happens during the dialogue session when the user is actually interacting with the, with the chatbot. The model acquisition unit was part of offline reasoning. It should happen before we have any session, before anything starts. Meanwhile, the planning unit is dynamic. So we actually first generate a plan offline before we start the session or at the very beginning of the session. But as I said, we also address replanning. Uh, if anything goes wrong in this dialogue, if anything happens, we can always replan the dialogue during the interaction to make sure our agent doesn't die. And then uh, how we evaluated this approach. So here, I first need to make a remark. It's well known in the dialogue community that the evaluation of dialogue systems is a very complex process, in fact. Uh, there is no consensus on what is a good dialogue system, so it totally depends on the domain for which you are developing the system. It totally depends on your requirements, on your needs, your goals, so there is no consensus on this. But the most common type of evaluation is still uh, based on user studies, which can be a very expensive uh, approach, but it is still, is still necessary. So in my research, we had a couple of different of evaluations, but I will discuss here today the evaluation that we conducted at the together with the Lazich lab. So in last October, last year, I was at the University of Lisbon and through the project Wide Health, uh, I was able to conduct the, this user study. I'm actually very thankful to this project. So it made it possible to recruit all the users. I had the support from Tiago, from Filipa, from everyone from Lazage. Thank you very much. And I, yeah, there I was able to conduct this evaluation. So there we conducted together three studies, three user studies. The first one, the first two studies, we used both bots. So we, we used, we tested the asthma support uh, chatbot that I showed previously in this presentation. So we, we had this prototype already, and then we conducted two types of user studies. One with health experts, we had pulmonologists that provided us a feedback on the system. And the other study was conducted with end users, which, uh, which was, we had asthma, not patients, but people that have some degree of knowledge in asthma. And then our third study was conducted uh, for a new boat, for a new domain, where we recruited some participants that played the role of dialogue authors, and they were invited to build a new bot for the acute di diagnosis domain. So now I will try to quickly talk about each of these studies. The first study, the one of the health experts, we had the support, we had the participation of, of four physicians, all of them were pulmonologists, and these physicians were invited to use BoofBot, to interact with Boot, BoofBot in a few sessions, and then provide their feedback, their opinion on the bot. So they evaluated the, if the questions that BoofBot was making are appropriate, they, they discussed if they would adopt the system, what they think, if it's good for the patient or not, and several other aspects. In conclusion, uh, these physicians, they saw the bot as a useful thing, as a useful tool for patients. But of course, as health experts, they highlighted several points. Uh, for example, they insisted that the bot must make more questions. The bot should not reach a conclusion so quickly. So actually the bot that we developed was based, uh, implemented only that action plan that I showed you in the beginning of this presentation. So all the questions, all the knowledge we had there were based on that action plan. But the physicians insist that we must make additional questions when a patient calls them, we make extra questions. So yeah, those questions would not be enough. 
In fact, more questions should could be implemented in with this approach. It can as long as you put the knowledge in the ontology, you can implement this. But yeah, we would need them in the specification as well. And another remark, another highlight from this expert is that maybe the asthma domain was not the most appropriate one because asthma patients, they already have the knowledge on the asthma disease. So it's not like they, they don't know the recommendations. Uh, maybe the bot would be more useful for new patients of asthma or patients that don't have an asthma crisis for a long time, which is quite common. Some patients don't have an asthma crisis for years. In this case, the bot would be very useful. Otherwise, like it's not so useful as the patient already know what to do. So for this study, as the physicians played the role of the end user, we also conducted a uh, SUS analysis. So we, we evaluated this, the system usability score, uh, where we reached the mark of the score of 68.75%. Uh, must say the in in the literature, the threshold for this uh, for this mark is 68%. So we did reach the minimum, but of course we see room for improvement. And we really believe that if it was for a new domain, this uh, for a domain different than asthma, this uh, SUS score could be improved. It could be better because the the physicians would have a better perception of how useful the system is. The next study, which involved asthma patients, I mean, uh, people that had some knowledge in asthma. So for this study, we had a total of 27 participants. Each participant conducted three dialogue sessions with the boat. And, for, uh, and we also had three different settings for this study. So this was invisible to the participants. They didn't know which setting they were participating. And these three settings, they are, they are different versions of the same system. So one setting was the full approach. Another setting, we didn't implement replanning. So the bot continued with the same plan until the end of the dialogue. And with the other setting, no, um, it was only system initiated actions the system did not allow the user to input information at any moment they wanted in the dialogue. So in our results, we evaluated the task, task success for these different settings. And in this, we could see that uh, we had a very high level of uh, users that completed all sessions. So basically all users were able to finish the, the dialogue interaction. There was only two cases that we, the user didn't finish. One was because the user got upset with the bot. The bot was not understanding what he said, so he quit. And the other one, we believe there was a mistake. The user misunderstood that the conversation was finished. The data accuracy and transaction success were, were also very high. Data accuracy means that uh, the information acquired by the bot was correct. And transaction success means that the correct classification was made. And here I have a very important remark that this too uh, should be, let's say it should be 100%. Because with automated planning, uh, there is no risk that the bot will misclassify the information. There is, given the information retrieved, the bot should always reach the same conclusion. So there is no risk that we have something wrong. What happened here and what happens in most of these dialogue systems that uh, follow this pipeline is that when you receive the information and this information is misunderstood by the natural language understanding component, this error is scared on to the dialogue manager and to the whole interaction. So what happened here was that the, the user input the information, the natural language understanding component did not understand. And then of course, we had the same error and we misclassified the patient in a few sessions. So this showed that we can um, search, we can look for a different natural language understanding components and we should improve this part. So we also analyzed the, the costs of the dialogue this information is actually more representative. It's, more, it's just a demonstration because also like the session duration doesn't really mean that a shorter session duration is it's a better thing because maybe the bot was asking more information to try to reduce its uncertainty, to try to not put the patient in a risk situation. So it doesn't mean you have less terms, it's better. So we're just demonstrating here. 
Uh, meanwhile, the system response time was always kept below two seconds. In a previous evaluation conducted early in my research, the experts, they, they stated that the system response should always stay below two seconds. So with the three different settings, we we're able to keep this score. And the correction rate means the, this, here is the mean, that's why it's zero. There were a few corrections made in your bot. But it means like whenever the bot did understand what the user said and then it asked, and it asked the user to repeat information or to say it in a different, uh, different words. So given our, our data, the correction rate was um, yeah, zero. The mean was zero. The average was a little more than this, but it was very low as well. Oh, I forgot to describe. CR UK here is actually another approach from a different, from different author for different researchers. Um, it's not, I didn't put really here to compare because these systems are actually not compared. CRUK was built for a cancer domain, for a different domain, and it used a different strategy. But we included uh, these, uh, these uh, the results as well to have some idea on our, how well our system was doing. So they have very lower response time, but ours is too acceptable. And since they have a completely different domain, that's why they have a different session duration, number of turns, so it's not really comparable. So in this study, we also conducted this system usability score and uh, did this SUS analysis. And for our three settings, we can say that we did reach the threshold from the literature. Although for the main setting, which is S1, we were slightly below the threshold, reminding the threshold is 68%. Uh, and for the others, we did achieve it very well. But here, actually, we cannot really provide an explanation why there was such a difference in the SUS score, mainly because S2 was the setting we, where we didn't have replanning, but this is invisible to the end user, so it's not like the user could perceive the difference. And actually, to better understand what happened with, in the SUS score here, we should conduct a, a longer study and also for a different domain, because several of the participants that we had in this user study, they also highlighted that uh, they have frequent asthma crisis, so they already know how to proceed in this situation. So this um, reminds us that we, yeah, this highlights the fact that we should uh, conduct this study again for a different health domain. And then finally, in the, our third user study, we had eight participants that played the role of dialogue authors. Half of these participants, they had some knowledge in dialogue systems. Half of them, they didn't have knowledge. And in this study, we were trying to evaluate the feasibility of no expert to evaluate a dialogue system, uh, to alter a dialogue system by using the proposed approach. We also evaluated the reusability of the approach, like if it was possible to uh, transform to use the same approach in a different domain rather than the asthma one. And we evaluated the costs of building a new system. So in this study, we realized that yes, the system and the approach is feasible for non-experts to alter the dialogue system because all of, all, all of our particip participants were able to build a working dialogue system. Actually, there was an error in two participants where uh, something wrong happened, but this was actually a technical error. Uh, I, I forgot to give permission in a giving folder, so something failed, but the whole approach worked and they could have a working dialogue system. So we constated that the approach was reusable. It did work out of this new domain, which was acute, di acute sinusitis diagnosis. It was a very restricted, a very small domain. We, we still had a full working dialogue system, so it was portable to this new domain. And the cost of building this new system was also very low because all participants were able to finish the whole implementation in the given time, the time frame we gave, which was uh, two hours. They used less than two hours, in fact. And they didn't have to make many questions. They didn't ask for much assistance from the admin of the session. Uh, so they were able to finish the implementation. So to conclude, in this work, we present an approach for the generation and update of health dialogue managers. So reminding, we can automatically generate a dialogue manager, and we can also update this dialogue manager if anything goes wrong, we don't lose our dialogue. We can always 
keep going, we replan our dialogue policy and we keep our, we keep our dialogue session on. So in this approach, we integrated automated planning and information management. For this, we introduced a new ontology, which is called Convology, and this ontology can be reused in different goal-oriented dialogue systems. It can, it can be used by the community. We introduced a new usefulness measure that's applicable to the health domain to identify how useful is a piece of information. Uh, in this approach, we simplify the translation of a direct problem to a planning problem. So a very important thing here is that no knowledge in automated planning is required for the dialogue author to use this approach. So, so who wants to implement the uh, new dialogue system by relying on this approach doesn't have to have this knowledge in automated planning because we are abstracted already all this information. And finally, to evaluate this approach, uh, our evaluation shows that we had for objective measures show that we have a very efficient dialogue manager so we can we have high data accuracy, we have uh, high numbers, high values for go achievement as well. The approach is reusable. We can uh, we can use this in a different domain. But then, of course, this approach was uh, this research started a little more than three years ago, and then we we have lots of room for improvement. We see several opportunities for future work in this research, and. And hopefully this research will continue with the new students in the next years, where we'll be exploiting, we'll be uh, going deeply into some open aspects that we saw in this research. And I thank you all for your attention. And these are some of the publications that resulted from this research. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Milan, for your presentation. Now we can open the session to for questions. You can open your mic or just um, raise your hand. Does anyone have questions to Milan? I think I'll, hello. Hi, it's Iago here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, I, I just wanted to comment a little bit on Milan's stay here and the work and also then leave a question for Milan. So first it was great having Milan here and uh, this was indeed supported by the Wild Health Project. This wasn't something so we didn't know each other. I didn't know anyone from our group, but then by the connection between FBK and FCID in the project, we were able to make it happen. I think this was, uh, so she talked about three studies uh, and we only started preparing those studies. We talked a little bit before, but uh, the preparation for these studies started when she arrived in Lisbon and she was still, um finishing some of the work and the preparation for those studies and so we had um less than a month to to do them so uh, we reached out to pulmonologists we reached out to to patients so this was an impressive effort um and, and milan did uh, uh, an excellent work both in while well, getting to this point but also then in conducting the studies i think there's a lot of value here um, you said something that is interesting because uh, we and we felt that in, in the studies, both with experts and the so-called patients, uh, that maybe diseases where people are already trained, uh, the conversation or the, the dialogue and, and the, the chatbot is less useful, uh, at, at least in this, well, following an action plan. So I, I, my question is twofold, is first for this, um, for this uh, chronic conditions, I would say, maybe the, the, the domain of the conversation should be a little bit larger. And so maybe not focused on an action plan, but broader. 
So, uh, and my question is, if that would be something that you think it's feasible. And the other thing would be, so what, if you have an idea, what would be like the best context for a, a chatbot like yours? Thank you for the question. Very good question, actually. Uh, well, in fact, we chose first the Asma domain because exactly because it was a contained domain. We have that as much on plan. Things are very, at least for us computer scientists, it's a very objective thing. It's very clear what are the symptoms, what are the recommendations to be given, and it it make it possible to implement our approach. Uh, yes, the current approach it, it, with the current approach, it is possible to implement longer dialogues with more information, more knowledge, for example. Uh, the planning actually has a limitation in the number of slots, the number of actions you implement in the plan, because after currently after I think 12 or 13 uh, slots, it becomes the planning time becomes too long, so it's not feasible. But the current approach makes it possible to divide this the dialogue into sub dialogues. So supposing that we have a huge domain with where we need to implement lots of information, we can divide it into, into small sub-dialogues and it, it's feasible. Um, yeah, and then the other question, which should be a better domain? Well, it totally depends because I think from our side, we need something very clear. It's easier to test, it's easier to build the plan, but maybe not so useful for the, for the healthcare community. I can't think of on the top of my head of another good example because chronic diseases are very objective. Well, diagnosis is also a very clear domain. We had this uh, example for acute diagnosis where we implemented the system. So it's a good example, maybe a system that support diagnosis. But also, again, if you want to support diagnosis in many different diseases, we will have the same problem as before we'll have to divide the whole dialogue into the many small sub-dialogues. And then we need, okay, this is possible, this is feasible, but before we need to think, okay, what's the best way to divide the sub-dialogues? Which symptoms should be in the first sub-dialogue? Which symptoms should be in the next one? Thank you, Milan. Any more questions? So if we don't have more questions, I will thank again, Milan, for your presentation. Um, and before we go, um, just a brief note. Um, the seminars are going to be interrupted during the month of July and August, uh, but we will return in September on the 6th. And um, as soon as we have more details about the next seminars, we'll let you know and hope to see you all there. Um, so thank you once again for your presence here. Thank you, Milan, for your presentation. Um, goodbye. Thank you all for your participation. Thanks so much.